Okay. So we talked about, so what is the big uh, sort of difference? What's the main difference between, like, if you're going to do, if you're deciding to do a MANOVA versus a profile analysis, what's the big difference? I actually pick on, pick on DeVere just because I can see his uh, sub-zero mask from over here. What would lead you to do one versus the other? What's the main ingredient? I, mean, I think what you're saying is true. So the the cause I, just so it's on the video, the the answer was that it's something about the DVs. That with Manova, I'm more interested in, in looking at differences between groups, and with uh, profile analysis, it's really more about looking at differences among the DVs. Now I would say it's actually close, but um, not quite what I was asking. But what you're saying is true, and that um, with Manova, we really are interested in just looking at the group differences. With profile analysis, the main interest often is the interaction between the groups and the and the patterns of the DVs. But the reason why that is is because we actually treat the DVs differently, and there's a there's a reason why we treat them differently. It, what is the quality that the DVs have to have in order for us to commensurate? That's the big word. Commensurate is correct. So if you have DVs that are either repeated, which means they're automatically commensurate, or you have different DVs that are commensurate, you can uh, do a profile analysis, which will likely give you the, the ability to test more hypotheses. Differences across um, the different DVs, differences between the groups, and an interaction. Where that same thing through a MANOVA, we would just look at the differences between the groups, because the DVs would, would be collapsed together into a composite, and that's it. We would just look at group differences. All right, so let's talk about how that actually works. How do we do that? So really the, the approach is very similar. If, this is, if you look at this, it's actually set up exactly the same way as if it were a mixed ANOVA. So you have between groups, again, with the, 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 the theme that runs through Tabash and Fandel's stuff. So you got belly dancers, politicians, administrators, and you're asking them to rate how much they like to read, to dance, to watch TV, and to ski. And I'm assuming that's snow skiing, not uh, water skiing, but uh, I don't know why. But um, so you got a couple different averages that go on. So like this is the mean for belly, for belly dancers and reading, right? Belly dancers, dancing, TV, skiing. And then this is the average if you were to take all of these and average across, you get an average for each person. That's the first person, the first belly dancer, right? Um, has an average of seven. The second one has 7.25, right? So you can average all those out and you actually get then an overall average. This is like if you're just collapsing across DVs and across people in the belly dancer uh, category, you would have this 7.3. And then the, the average, for politicians, for instance, is this five, and for administrators across, it's this 3.5. And then we can also average, if I, if I ignore the different types of people, which I like I just have 15 people, it doesn't matter, you know, what their, what their background is or what their job is, and I just go, you know, and average those five scores with those five scores, with those five scores, I get this mean down here, sorry, this mean down here, which is the average rating for reading, this is the average rating for dance, the average rating for TV, and the average rating for skiing. So we could set this up and do it like a, within groups, uh, you know, like a mixed ANOVA, uh, where we could use um, the, the sort of group means here to do, uh, you know, the between groups portion. We can use the means down here to do the sort of within groups portion. We can use the cell means to look at the interactions and stuff. And then we can also use these averages here to create, if you remember those like those S and A by S factors that are um, the, in, the error terms. So we have an A by, we'd have an A by S um, 
so we'd have a, a uh, sorry, an, an S with an A uh, factor, and then we'd have a B by S interaction for the within groups repeated measures portion. But that's not what we're going to do here. We're going to do this as a in sort of a MANOVA framework. So if you're thinking about this as, as a MANOVA, the between groups part seems sort of you know straightforward. We could just try to figure out a way to weight these and combine them in some way to um, make the belly dancers, politicians, and administrators as different as possible, which is what MANOVA does. But now we have more things to test. The easiest thing actually is to test the difference between belly dancers, politicians, and administrators, because that's going to be done as a univariate ANOVA. We're going to use these scores here, all the way down here, and just do a one-way ANOVA. Pretend like these scores don't exist at all, and just look at their averages, and treat this as a one-way ANOVA, comparing that mean to that mean to that mean, and just get a univariate ANOVA. The other tests, like the test for the repeated measures part, uh, what, what do we call the test for the repeated measures part in a profile analysis? Anybody? Actually, I see, I see Matt. So, Matt, what's the test for the repeated measures part? That's exactly right, flatness. Flatness is the test of whether or not the repeated measures, the line going across here, would actually be. Uh, be flat. If it's flat, that means there's no differences across time. If it's if we reject flatness, then that means that there is some differences across time or across, in this case, there are four different commensurate DVs. So the, the reason why I picked this particular example is because we could, th there's no reason why we couldn't do this as a MANOVA. Uh, these are, they're, they're really four different DVs, so we could just do this as a MANOVA, and what that would do is we, we get one test that looks at the differences between the, the three groups, it would try to combine these together in some meaningful way, some into some super composite, and we would get one multivariate test for groups, and that's it. What profile analysis allows us to do is to do all three tests, the between groups, which is the equal levels test, the flatness test across the different DVs, and the interaction, which is parallel profiles. So it, it models after a repeated measures or mixed ANOVA, but we're actually able to use the multivariate assumptions like the equality of um, variance, covariance matrices instead of something like sphericity, which is much harder to, to do, or to uh, at least to achieve. Um, all right, so if we, we actually plot stuff out, we can look at this and we can think about the different kinds of, you know, the different kinds of patterns going on. So this is really, um, the graph in this way is is best suited for uh, trying to graph out the interaction. So if you look, if we go back a second. If I take these means, so let's look at belly dancers. Belly dancers have a mean of 6.6, 9.4, 5.8, and 7.4. So belly dancers blue. So that's that. The I forgot. I forgot the numbers. 6.6, the 9.4, the 5. Point whatever, and the 7. Point whatever. Those. Those are those four means. So really, these are all just you know plotting out the the cell means. So let's see, Christopher, what? Tell me one of the three profile analysis hypotheses you think might be rejected based on this graph. So you got equal levels, parallel profiles, and um, flatness. Are you there, Christopher? I see you. There you go. All right, so tell me what. Okay, so tell me why. So you're talking, so we think it would be a significant equal levels test. So that so what that would require is to look at if I look at these four points on the yellow line. So for you know, forget about looking at this graph for this we actually have the numbers, right? So we know that 7.3 is different than 5, is different than 3.15. Those are the averages. But forget, you know, if you're just looking at this graph, the way you think about equal levels is you would think about these four points on this yellow line. If I average those out, it's probably, I don't know, somewhere in here, right? Actually, I get a marker. The yellow line's probably somewhere, I don't know, if I, ever, if I were to average them out, it'd probably be something like here, I don't know, I'm just guessing, right? 
And if I were to average out the pink line, that one's actually probably the easiest to figure out because it's basically flat anyway, right? I have that more or less. And then the blue line on top, if I were to average that out, it looks like somewhere in here. And I'm doing this because equal levels really is comparing the groups. So if I'm comparing the groups, it means I'm collapsing, you know, I'm collapsing this way. I'm gonna try and average out everything going, you know, average out the dots going sort of cross time. I'm gonna average over the read, dance, TV, and ski, and try to get an average for belly dancers, an average for politicians, an average for administrators. So those are the equal levels things. So I, I would agree with, with Christopher that it's likely there's an equal levels. Whether it's significant or not, I don't know yet. I'm gonna test it. It looks like there's an equal levels difference. What other, let's see, uh, Lucas, what other tests might you um, reject given this graph? Okay, so tell me why. Okay. So another, yeah. So another way of saying that is that the lines don't have the same pattern, right? Each of the lines in each of the three groups don't have the same pattern. So it's likely there's going to be an interaction, right? This. This group's going like up, down, and up. This group's sort of going, it's just flat. This group's going down, staying the same, and coming back up again. So they have three different patterns, three different profiles. So their profiles are not parallel. What about um, the flatness test? Would we reject that or not? And how do we know? Ouch. See, I'll throw it. Maybe I'll ask uh, Robert. Would I. Reject the parallel, the flat, the flatness test with this, and how would you know? Okay. <laughs> right. Mm hmm. All right, so one of the ways, uh, yeah, I would, I would agree with that assessment. The way that I would sort of look at that, if I really wanted to know, uh, if I was given this and sort of trying to figure that out, I would think, all right, look at these three dots here, The starting at uh, for read, look at those three dots, right? Where would the average be? Well, okay, so there's two dots right on top of each other, so probably a little closer to this one than that one. So probably somewhere like here, maybe, maybe put a dot like that. And then these three points uh, would probably average out to be somewhere right above there too, because the blue is a little farther away than the yellow. Eh. Here's where it gets interesting though, because these looks like, okay, looks like we're starting to do flatness a little bit. But this one, because these two are similar and this one's farther away, I would say it's probably, uh, this is just a guess, it doesn't have to be sort of super accurate. And then sort of back to maybe here again, right? So it looks like, we would have sort of had a flat, a flat line, if not for on TV for some reason. All right, so TV seems to be the, the, the part that's actually making it sort of go non-flat. Yeah, because then the average, this average would sort of pop up, you know, and then uh, it would be totally flat. So the, the, yeah, so, so if I look at the, it is across all three, but what's really, what's bringing this mean down, right? These two are pretty much right in line with flatness. It's this one group here, right? This, the, the point uh, for administrators that's really dragging the, the mean down somewhat and sort of causing it to sort of go against the sort of flatness. So the, the, I'm pointing this out because looking at this, the way you look at equal levels is to average sort of going this is to average this way and get you know and, and create one one average for each group. If you're looking at flatness, you're going to average this way. You're going to average across the groups and get one average for for reading, one average for dance, one average for TV, one average for ski, and that looks like this sort of pale green line here, which you know whether or not we'd actually significantly reject flatness is we'd have to do a test, but at least there's the potential to to reject flatness because of that 
uh, that one point that sort of dips down there. Yeah. Mm hmm. So you actually, um, you know, point out the issue that uh, anytime you have an interaction, like we know we have parallel profiles is rejected. The profiles are not parallel. So interpreting any of the main effects becomes sort of a little bit goofy. It's a little bit hard to do. So you got to imagine that that pale green line there is actually the main effect across the Reed Dance TV ski. And since um, any deviation for that, again, it may not be significant because we'd have to test it. But you know, if the point were here, right? I, I would, I would. There'd be no chance it'd be rejected. But the fact it actually is a little bit off, and I really, I may have underestimated. Maybe, maybe the average is a little farther down because that yellow line's, you know, far down there. It may have been a, a, a bigger dip, which means this. It's really this one dv. It's tv, right? That's actually different than the other dvs that may cause a um, an effect for you know, to, cause us to reject flatness. So for that, this green line is a main effect because to look at a main effect, you're basically averaging over the other effects. So we're averaging over the groups and getting one line for the average of each dv. So what's what's being plotted? Uh, the, the line's still there. Hold on a second. Um, what's being plotted there? To plot for the plot for flatness is here, right? Five point three three or five point five three, five point four. There's a dip down to 4.27, so you know it's like a, a full unit lower, and then back up to 5.4. So these three, the 5.53, 5.4, and 5.4, look like you know look like it's staying pretty flat. When you get to that 4.27, there is a dip, and that may or may not, depending on the significance test, lead us to to rejecting uh, the flatness test. So it's those means, but how do we get those means? Well, we averaged the 6.6. .6, the 5 and the 5, right, to get 5.53. 9.4 and 4.8 and 2 to get 5.4. The 5.8, 5.2. So we do, I was doing the same thing just visually, taking, you know, that dot, averaging it with that one and that one, and getting it pointed somewhere around here. Taking this dot and that one and that one, because this one's a little bit farther away from this one than this one is, right? I'm saying it's, okay, it's probably, you know, around there too. But because this yellow one's farther away than the other two, it's going to pull the mean down, you know, a little bit. And then over here, it's going to go sort of back up again, you know, to about there. So I was just sort of visually sort of finding an average between the points, which is the same. It should get us more or less to where these, these averages are, just, you know, from a, you know, an estimate perspective. Of course, you know, this is all going to be compared, you know, to this 5.15, which is sort of the grand mean of all things, especially for the, the univariate tests for equal levels. Everything else we're going to look at as a, as a multivariate test. All right. Does that help to clarify the, the flatness, equal levels, and parallel profiles tests, I hope? All right. So profile analysis is similar to MANOVA. Actually, it's not just similar to MANOVA. It's the exact same thing, essentially, as MANOVA, just that we're going to rearrange the data a little bit. The actual data that we are going to use or analyze for, um, for profile analysis uh, is data that we rearrange into segments. And I mentioned segments before. Segments are these differences between adjacent points, right? So right here, this just happens to be the way that it's set up, which is uh, a little bit problematic for when you have um, commensurate DVs that aren't repeated. But since we have read and dance next to each other, we can subtract them and get a difference between read and dance. We can subtract dance and TV to get a difference there, and TV and ski to get a difference there too. So we're going to convert all four of these DVs into three segments. That looks like this. Uh, oops, looks like I lied. It looks like this. I thought I had. Nope, oh, maybe I'm wrong. It looks like here, it looks like this. So instead of having uh, four DVs, we have three 
DVs that are made up of this sort of segmented or, or um, this linearly transformed data that we, we, we have done by just taking the difference between adjacent points. Read minus dance, dance minus TV, and then TV minus ski. So each of these now represent the difference. So on average, how much is is read different than dance? It's on average about a negative 2.8. The negative tells me that dance then, they like dancing on average higher than they do reading, which makes sense because they're belly dancers. So I can imagine why they would like dancing more than, uh, than reading. But politicians, it sort of flips around. The difference there actually is um, close to zero. And for administrators, they seem to like reading more than dancing. So on average, the difference is close to zero uh, for all those all those groups. So like, think of these as sort of little slopes. What's the change from read to dance, where it's close to zero? What's the change from dance to TV, where it's a positive uh, one? You know, on average, there's a unit change of about one. From TV to ski, where there's an average about a uh, change sort of downward from uh, TV to skiing. So instead of plotting out or looking at the points in this graph, I'm actually now interested in what is the change from this point to that point, right? So there's a positive change here, really no change there, and negative change there, right? Except the way that because we're doing read minus dance, this ends up becoming a negative because read minus dancing, it will be a negative number. And uh, for this group, read minus dance is going to be a positive number. But it's still, the sign doesn't matter except just to tell us which direction. It's just, uh, but this is a way of sort of looking at, uh, I'm now interested in the line and not the points anymore. What was the change from uh, one dv to the next? This makes a lot more sense to think about this as time. So if I take time one minus time two and it's positive, it means they went, you know, they went down because time one minus time two. I could also do time two minus time one, which may make a little more sense in looking at sort of change. But in reality, the 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 order or direction doesn't really make a difference. It's going to take that sort of segmented data and then and then um, and then analyze it using the steps that we would with MANOVA. So the first step, if you're, if you're going to do this before you even get to that segmented data, I got a little ahead of myself there. Is to actually do the univariate part. Right? So equal levels is a univariate test, so each person score. Should be, there should be a apostrophe there. But each person's score is the average across all the DVs, and the group average is found by averaging the group mean uh, score in each DV. So all we're going to do is take the data, this data here, we're going to use this data down the side here, and treat this just as a one-way ANOVA to get our equal levels difference. I've got to step out of this for a second. So if we look at this, this looks like a one-way ANOVA with one change. Anybody spot the change, the difference from a regular one-way ANOVA? Actually, I guess there's a couple differences, but it really is all part of the same change. So in this, in this case, we're treating it as if there is only one DV, because we're averaging across all the DVs. But what do you notice different in the in the notation that you don't normally see in a one-way ANOVA. Yeah, all of a sudden there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a the end there that often is when you have that, that part is the between groups. You often have, you know, it's the mean of each group minus the grand mean square. We usually multiply by n, but here we don't just have n. What else is there? Yeah, what's p stand for? p is the number of dvs. So why all of a sudden are we multiplying by the number of dvs at the same time? Because if you look at this 7, like for the, the first belly dancer here, right? This 7 is the average of those four dvs, right? So this is not an individual score. It's an individual average. This is the next person's average, the next person's average. So when I get this 7.3, this 7.3 is not the average of five numbers. It's the average of four numbers times five numbers. I mean, it's it's averaging four numbers down, you know, across, and then averaging five numbers down. So we're going to multiply by both the number of DVs to account for this average, and then uh, by the number by the n in each group to account for this average. So even though we're treating it as a one-way ANOVA, it has a slight little twist in that because we're we're using the the subject averages. 
we need to account for that by multiplying by both n and p. And if, if you want this to really be sort of accurate or whatever, I uh, probably shouldn't use green because I won't show up. Uh, you're going to use try pink maybe. This is really not, this is really an average. Right? This is really the average each person's average minus the group average, and we're weighting that by p as well because um, each person's average that we're subtracting back here. Each person's average, each person, this, this score that we're using to get to that within groups is actually the difference between this person's average across the DVs minus the group average. So we got to account for that when doing this part of it. So this really is um, the average, each person's average minus the group average, and that's why we're weighting it by P. And if we get that, we're going to get the a sum of squares total that's going to be this, you know, divided up in the sum of squares between and within. This is our effect for equal levels, and this is our um, our error, All right? So, and if we're going to be fully accurate here, this is also each individual person's average, the average for every person in each group, because we're using their Averages across the DVs as their as their score in a one-way ANOVA, which is why we got to tweak it a little bit by having this this p uh, weight in there as well. Questions? Does that make sense? So we're going to use the data in that rightmost column. Pretend like the rest of this stuff doesn't exist, right? This stuff doesn't exist. It's just this column. We're going to treat it as a one-way ANOVA. Except with the knowledge that this seven is not an individual score, but a mean, so we're going to bring that extra weight uh, for p in there just to make sure that that weight that is weighted um, by the fact that there are actually four numbers that are actually going into creating that one score or that one mean. All right. So that part is the easy part in the sense of that's something that you can even do by hand. It's like something we did in, you know, 485 when we were doing sort of mixed ANOVAs, we did a similar thing there to get the differences between, you know, the between groups part. We did that exact same process to do that. We did nothing's different. <clears throat> All right, so that's pretty straightforward. And here I'll even show, you know, what it looks like. So between groups, right? The first group has a mean of 7.3. So I'm going to subtract 5.15, which is the grand mean. I'm going to do that for the next group. I'm going to do that for the next group. So all three groups I'm subtracting out, taking their mean, subtracting the grand mean. I'm going to add all those up, and I'm going to weight by 4 because the 4 dVs, and by 5 because there are 5 subjects in each group. For within groups, let me take the first person score. So, so even though it, it's almost like score in quotes, this is the first person's individual average or average across the DVs. That score up here in the corner, that seven is the first person's average across all the DVs. So I'm going to take that number, subtract the group mean, square it, add the next person's score to 7.25 minus the group mean and square it. I'm going to keep going. This 7 minus 7.3, 7.5 minus 7.3, 7.75 minus 7.3. And then I'm going to switch to the next group. It's going to be 4 minus uh, 5, 4.5 5 minus 5, 5.25 minus 5 each time I'm squaring it, 6.25 minus 5, and 5 minus 5. And I'll go to the next group. 1.75 minus um, 3.15. Am I doing this? Yeah. 1.75 minus 3.15, 3.5 minus 3.15, 3.25, 3.5, 3.75, all minus 3.15. Oh, so that's that last number, 3.75 minus 3.15. Scoring all while I go, well, because each of those numbers, 1.75, 3.5, 3.25, are all the average of the four dVs, I need to weight it by four. When I do that, I'll then have a sum of squares between and within that represents, um, you know, there are values we can use to then get an F test for the equal levels test. 
That part, even though it may seem a little convoluted and there's extra things that we don't normally do in one way, it's actually you know fairly straightforward. It can be done by hand fairly easily. The rest of it isn't so much, but we can add all that stuff up and get a test for the between groups and then an error term for that, you know, divide across and get an F test, test for uh, significance. So it's a normal univariate ANOVA and they get, you get a summary table. In SPSS, when you get output from, um, you know, a mixed ANOVA, you remember before you'd have the within subjects table and then down below you'd have a between subjects table that was like separate. This is the, these are the values you find in the between groups um, effect. In this case, the groups would be, you know, it's like profession. So it'd probably be labeled, you know, uh, profession or sum of squares for profession and sum of squares um, for uh, sum of squares error for profession or something like that or sum of squares for S or something like that. So you'd actually be, um, you know, get that in that separate between groups table and you use the F here to sort of, you know, test it for significance. There's obviously a, I mean, an F of 44.145 is huge. So questions about the, the equal levels part. Uh, good dokey. All right. I like the, I like the use of the word actually, that actually makes sense as if nothing has up to this point, but that actually does. All right, that's good. It's probably probably not too far off. All right, so preparing the data for multivariate tests. So again, I mentioned segments before, but let's talk, you know, just mention it again here. DVs can be combined in any number of ways, but one of the easiest is just to take the difference between parallel or sort of adjacent sections of the, of the DVs. Is it has shown that, the, that what linear combination uses is irrelevant, as long as you sort of combine them sort of linearly, um, easiest way is, again is just subtracting adjacent um, uh, adjacent DVs or adjacent um, time points and creating segments that way. Then the rest of it you can actually then use. So I used that exact thing. I just took the first DV minus the second DV, the second DV minus the third, and the third minus the fourth. So you can sort of see right away why this sort of converts it over to, um, it helps to convert things over to a, a sort of more multivariate test. Because now we have three DVs, and this is a, a little bit more in line with testing for flatness. Because if there was no difference between read and dance, what would my average be for the difference between read and dance? If on average, everyone liked reading and dancing the same, this would be... Yeah, if everyone liked dance and TV the same, this would be, and so would that, right? So the flatness test now becomes, we assume that if flatness is true, like under the null hypothesis, right, that these three means would be zero. There's no change between adjacent DVs, so these should all be zero. So you can, you can sort of see how that, that would work. If we actually want to do a test for it, we just test the means we actually have versus zero. If they're different than zero, then we reject flatness. If they're not different than zero, then we don't reject flatness. So this is, this is really setting it up almost like um, a multivariate, uh, you remember back, probably going back a long time ago, doing one way, t, uh, not one way, one sample t-test. We took the, a sample mean versus zero see if the mean was different than zero. It's the same thing. It's sort of doing a multivariate one sample t-test comparing each of the segments to zero. And if we can reject it, it means that there is a change from one dv to the next. The, the segments are not zero. So you can think of segments as sort of like a, it's like a proxy for a slope. If this is zero, that means there's no slope between, uh, between the, the groups. If you look at, go back to our graph again real quick. Like I said, if we actually looked at the change between here and here, right? The difference on average between these, these two groups, between read and dance, the actual means being 5.53 and 5.4, right? There's, there's really no change from the average for reading and the average for dance. So that's why we're getting a number that's, that's close to zero, 0.13 or something like that. Oops, I could. 
So that point 0.13 tells me there's really zero change for meeting dance. The, another way of thinking that is that if I ignore the belly dancers, politicians, administrators, I just think I have 15 people, 15 people in my sample rated reading and dancing about the same. So I got, I have almost a zero change. The 15 people in my sample, when comparing dancing and TV, uh, did actually prefer dancing to TV slightly. Because if I take dance minus TV, I'm getting a positive average. All right, so there is a slight, you know, the dancing slightly better than TV on average. And then if you're looking at TV versus skiing, well, the average goes the other direction. The people actually like skiing more than TV just as much as they like dance more than TV. Because right? they're about the same number. These numbers aren't zero, but whether or not they're far enough away from zero to be significant, we'll have to actually do a test. Questions so far? About segments, about what all this means, why we're looking at this stuff versus zero. All right. Move on before I run out of time again. Okay. So um, parallelism, which is the uh, this you know, parallel profiles test, really asks the question: Is there a difference between groups on different scores made by subtracting adjacent scores on DVs? Is this a parallelism it sounds like flatness. Yeah, it's not really. I don't know why I called it parallel because I think in, in other. Yeah. Okay. This is for parallel profiles. Okay. So. Really ask the question, is there a difference between groups on different scores made by subtracting adjacent scores on DVs? What does that mean? Go back to here again. Just like I talked about this, is this zero versus that being zero versus that being zero, right? If there's any difference there, we reject flatness. Okay. Well, is the difference between reading and dancing the same for belly dancers as it is for politicians as it is for administrators? Uh, is, is you know is the the difference between dance and TV the same for belly dancers, uh, politicians, administrators? Now we're getting at the parallel profiles, the sort of interaction um, test for uh, for profile analysis, which is what this is saying. Really ask the question: Is there a difference between groups on different scores made by subtracting adjacent scores? So it's, it's got the groups and it's got the different scores. So it's got both of them simultaneously. So we're looking at sort of an interaction between them. In the example, like, is the difference between reading and dancing the same for dancers, politicians, administrators? And it's simultaneously asking, this is why it becomes multivariate. It's asking, is it, is it for between reading and dancing, between dancing and um, TV, and between TV and skiing, it's asking all three of those at the same time. Is the difference, is, are those differences between the three groups on each of those DVs, those segments, at the same time? All right. So it's asking all those questions simultaneously, which is what makes it sort of multivariate, sort of univariate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> something like pouring tea or something. All of a sudden, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, where did the water sound come from? Okay. Um, in the okay, so it's an example of one-way Minova would be used to test the parallelism hypothesis. Each segment represents a slope between two original DVs. If a multivariate effect is found, then so the, the idea being that if a multivariate effect is found, because I'm not going to take these segments and try to combine them together into a, um, you know, into a super DV to make the groups different. If, the, if we can find that, that means there is an interaction between the different segments and the groups. So it's just basically doing you know, what we normally do in a MANOVA, trying to combine these together to differentiate the groups. And if we can do that, then there is some kind of interaction between the different DVs and the groups. All right. All right. So in the example, in one-way MANOVA, we use to test the parallelism hypothesis. Each segment represents a slope between two original DVs. If a multivariate effect is found, then there is a difference in slope between at least two of the groups on at least one of the segments. Right? So all it takes is to find, um, you know, a, a significant effect is that two of the groups have to be different on at least one of those DVs, and then you can afterwards look to see 
um, using univary tests, which what the differences actually are on those different uh, DVs between the groups. Try and pull the interaction apart somewhat. Uh, flatness, um, I sort of already already talked about it, but I mean, but I'll talk about it again. So this is a test that the average slope segment is different than zero for at least one pair of DVs. You go back. So all, all it's testing is this mean different than zero at the same time as asking if this means different than zero. And at the same time, asking if this means different than zero, which is why it's a multivariate test. So, so it's basically like a, a one sampled t test. Is my mean different than zero? It's just doing those for three means simultaneously, which makes it multivariate. So it says perform as a multivariate equivalent to a one sampled t test called a one sampled tau squared or Hotelling's tau squared test. Okay. Anyway, the. Basically, the average of each segment across groups is used to compute this, and we're basically going to be subtracting zero instead of actually subtracting some uh, actual mean. We're going to take those values minus zero, and then we're going to take those differences, multiply by the transpose to create a SSCP matrix the same way we would have in um, you know, in MANOVA. It's just instead of subtracting the means, we're subtracting zero and creating an SSCP matrix that way. And that's going to then create an SSCP matrix for um, for flatness, essentially. And then we're going to compare that to the sum of squares and cross products matrix, the S matrix for within groups. And we can actually then get a multivariate F test that way as well. Same. So if you think about this as being sort of oh, it's complicated, a lot of stuff going on. The takeaways here is the equal levels is just um, one way NOAA. Right? Uh, based on on those sort of averages, to do the parallel profiles, you're really just creating the segments get created, and then you're just doing a MANOVA. A MANOVA that, you, that we did in the last chapter, exactly the same test. Nothing's different, except that you first subtract the the adjacent scores to create segments. Then. You get this extra test where you, where you actually look at the averages for each DV or for each time compared to zero, which is basically like doing a one sample uh, t test just on all the segments at once. It makes it multivariate. So there's there's each test. There are two multivariate ones. Uh, equal level, uh, not equal levels. Equal levels is the univariate one. And parallel profiles and flatness are multivariate because it is testing the segments simultaneously, either across groups or relative to zero. And those two tests then, um, you know, can tell you whether or not the you know, the line is flat or not, whether the there's interaction between the groups across time. And those are both multivariate. Back up. Questions before we start talking numbers, because you know this may this doing this be either help or or not. It may go the other direction. Giving you uh, an application with numbers may help to sort of solidify what's going on. It also may lead to more questions or confusion, depending on how it goes. So, any questions we can clarify now? Let's do that, and then we'll go on to looking at numbers plugged in here. Nothing. Alrighty. Let's move on because I, I gotta I wanna get through a lot of this stuff. So let's talk about for parallelism. So this is parallelism is another way of saying parallel profiles. So if I want to look at the interaction, all right, I can if if um for the first uh belly dancer, back up. So where the score is negative three, four, and one. Mm -mm. All right, their scores are negative three. Four and one, right? So for that belly dancer, I take negative three, negative four, sorry, negative three, four, and one. The negative 2.8, 3.6, so negative 1.6 come from the group average, negative 2.8. 3.6 and 1, negative 1.6. So I'm taking each individual 
score on the segment minus the segment average. So even though I'm saying this is parallelism, this, we're first sort of finding the, the within groups part. But so for the first belly dancer, taking their three scores minus the three means, and I get these differences. So, right, so there's my, my uh, difference between each of the each of the first participants scores minus the group mean, and I need to square it. So in matrix terms, to square, we're gonna take that difference, we're gonna multiply it by its transpose, which is these two here. So those three numbers minus the transpose of those three numbers gives me, um, it'll, it'll give me a, a sum of squares and cross product matrix for the first person. And I would just do that 14 more times to in, add them up and get a sum of squares, uh, or sum of squares and cross products matrix for within groups, this S within groups matrix. This is my sum of squares and cross products matrix that's been summed up across all 15 people. But the process is similar. We're gonna do this same thing. Take each person's score minus the means of their group. I'm gonna multiply that by its transpose to get uh, a sum of squares and cross products matrix for each person and then add up just like we normally would with, uh, with the sum of squares. You have the sum in front, right? So we're gonna add up all those sum of squares and cross product matrices to, into one S matrix for within groups. So this is now the matrix counterpart to our sum of squares within groups or sum of squares for error. And this is gonna apply to both, uh, I think, equal levels and for parallel profiles, the same within groups matrix. Okay, so that's within groups. So now we need to do between groups, S matrix, you need to get the difference between each group mean and the grand mean for each segment. So for the first group, so go back, the first group has a mean of 2.8, 3.6, and negative 1.6, right? The second group has a mean of 1.2, negative 0.4, and 0.2. And then administrators have a mean of 3.2 and negative 2. We're going we're gonna to compare those to each of these, each of these means um, for each of the segments. So group 1, negative 2.8, 3.6, and negative 1.6 minus those three segment means. And I get a between groups differences, you know, here. I want to multiply that difference by its transpose. So there's the differences. Multiply by its transpose. And I'll do that for group one, for group two, and for group three, in order to get a sum of squares between groups matrix. Now, if you were to take and do that for each of those groups and add them up, you wouldn't get this matrix because what's missing? What we normally have to do for between groups, sum of squares. If I just add up the deviations and you know with these transposes and add them up across the three groups, I wouldn't get this matrix. So for sum of squares between groups, what do we normally do that's different than the other sums of squares? Nobody remembers? Sure you do. Sure you do. Some of each. So this is, you know, if this were regular old sum of squares, it would be something like this, right? This green mean squared. This is each, sorry, I'm screwing this up. Each group mean minus the grand mean squared what normally is included in a, in a sum of squares between groups that isn't in sum of squares within groups or sum of squares total. Are you thinking, are you thinking, think interaction, no. Yes, there's always an N here. Boop. So if I'm doing this as a as a matrix equation, it's the same basic idea. I need the I need the I now I now have a, a, a Y matrix 
for the means, right, of all the, for each, you know, for each group. I'm subtracting a matrix of grand means. Instead of squaring it, I'm multiplying it by its transpose, right? Um, these are matrices, not individual scores. So I'm multiplying by its transpose, but I still have to take all that and multiply it by n in order to get my S between groups matrix. Does that make sense? It's the equivalent of it is for a univariate. I'm just going to add up all those scores, all these, all these deviations multiplied by their transpose for each group. I'm going to add up all the groups, but I still have to multiply by n in order to get this S between groups matrix, because it's still the direct counterpart to the sum of squares when it was univariate. Okay. So it's just, it needs an N there still, because we're still with the, um, with thin groups, we're still doing it for every single individual, but for between groups, we're only doing it for groups, so they're not really comparable. They're not as many things being added up, so I have to multiply by N in order to sort of make them comparable or comparable. So that's how we get the between groups for, and this is actually was testing for parallel profiles. I know it sounds odd, but this, this between groups counterpart to, uh, a um, uh, mixed ANOVA is actually testing for the interaction. Um, and you can actually, lambda is calculated the same way. You would, you would take um, <clears throat> the, the, I forgot the equation, something like lambda equals the, the determinant of the with S within groups matrix over S within groups plus S um, between groups and you get lambda and then you can test lambda for, you know, convert that into an F using that equation we saw before. It's exactly, do the, this is really the exact same process you would do, basically just doing a one-way MANOVA um, and that's testing for parallel profiles. And the reason why it's testing for parallel profiles and not just typical um, MANOVA is because we subtracted and created segments. Those are now differences between adjacent time points, which you can't do if they're not on the same scale. So they're on the same scale, so subtracting actually makes sense. And uh, it actually tells us sort of change across time. You know, are the groups changing across time in a different pattern? That's what this sort of um, ANOVA is testing for. So that's, we did equal levels univariate. We did a, a MANOVA test that is looking at parallel profiles. And the last one is that sort of hotelings tau squared. So the test for flatness is basically taking those three grand means that we had, the means of each segment, and it's going to compare that to zero. Literally, I'm going to be subtracting zero from each of these because this is the null hypothesis. There's no difference between uh, reading and dancing. I would expect the mean to be zero for that, for that segment. No difference between dancing and TV, I expect a zero. No difference between TV and skiing, I expect a zero. So it's comparing the means we actually got to the means we expect under the null, which means I'm really subtracting out nothing, just taking those means, and I'm going to um, take the means, right? And I'm going to multiply them by their transpose. And I'm going to divide by the sum of squares within groups. But to divide by sum of squares within groups, that's really basically just the 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 inverse, right? Inverse of of within groups. So this so this will look like this. It's the it's the s. Actually, it's already there. But s for um, I'll call this the uh, call it parallel profiles. S for, <laughs> actually I don't want to say PP over and over again, it's just not going to be good. S for, um, uh, I'll just say it's the repeated measures component, right? The S for repeated measures part of this times, uh, or multiply, so you have that by the within groups component sort of, um, 
inverted. And then you have the same um, S for repeated measures there as well. So whenever you invert something like this, right, you're basically saying, I want to take my SRM times its transpose over the S within groups, right? Because that's why this is in the middle. You're dividing by it. So this is in the, this, this is going to be like, like sum of squares over the sum of squares for, um, actually, this, these aren't S's. These are, add it, whatever. Because in order to take and create the S, the S repeated measure is what he's talking about, is going to be that um, 0.13, 1.13, and negative 1.13. I'm doing it backwards. Doop, 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 doop. It's um, 0.13, 1.13, and negative 1.13. It's that matrix times the same 1.13, 1.13, 1 1.13, and negative 1.13. This is going to give me this S for the repeated measures part for the parallel profiles. Sorry, not parallel profiles, for the flatness test. I even call it that. S for flatness. All right, let me get a, a, a matrix that's going to be multiplying these, this by this. And then if I take that and um, divide it by its, um, by the, the S for within groups, it's basically like taking the S for flatness over the S for error or S for within groups, which is then converting that over to this sort of tau square value. The only thing that's different with it is that, you notice it's going in reverse order. It's taking this first, this is on the other side, divided by this whole thing, because what this is, it's a, this is a, a one by three times a three by three times a three by one. So it's doing it in reverse order because in the end what you're going to get is a single number. If I do it in this order, this times this, it's going to give me a three by three. But if I do this times this in reverse order, I'm going to get a, a, a one by one. So at the end, because that's what we want, we want a single test value, this uh, tau square one single number. To get that, I'm actually just doing it in reverse order. This times its transpose here, which is why this it says this transposed times, you know, or divided by the within groups matrix times the the regular um, matrix here. And it, it, it gives me a single number. This is a one by three times a three by three and then times a three by one. And then I multiply that whole thing by 15. Why am I multiplying by 15? Why is there a 15 at the beginning here? Yeah, it's my end, but why is it my end? Going back to the... Yeah, it's the number of scores or whatever that we use to create each of those means. So this point, point 0.13 here is the average of those five plus those five plus those five, right? and divided by 15. So this average is the average of 15 scores. So because of that, I got to weight those differences by 15. Okay. You could also do this in the same way if you wanted to test this as an F. Um, this is like doing this hotelings tau squared thing. But you could just take, um, uh, you know, f like I said here, find, find this S for flatness doing this, right? And then take the S for within groups, we did before, over uh, the S for flatness plus the S for within groups. And that will give you your lambda. And then you can use that to find F. Just do it that way. This is just a different way of doing it. That gives you a single, a single value, uh, this tau squared number. Um, 
without having to find lambda first. It's just going directly to a tau squared. It only works because it's basically a one sample t-test um, comparing these three means to zero. That's why it's called a tau squared instead of an f. But anyway, questions about that stuff? Three tests, equal levels, univariate. Um, you basically apply a MANOVA to the segmented data and you get, a, you get the parallel profiles test. You take the means of each DV compared to zero and you get, a, uh, you get the flatness test. And you can test that with the telling tau squared that's shown here. You can convert it over to a lambda just like you would normally and um, for a MANOVA and you know, look that up um, with an F test. And otherwise, that's the three tests, the, the three different tests for a profile analysis. How much time we have left here? Okay. And even this shows you like how to take that tau squared number, the 5.5825, and convert it over to an F, right? It's just all it's just doing is taking the, the weights, the N, the K is the number of groups, P is the number of um, DVs, and it's just weighting it. And then if you look, lambda also relates back to it's 1 over 1 plus tau squared because um, they're sort of going to be related. Uh, tau squared and f are sort of similar. So it's just a way of converting. You can convert this over to a lambda. You can convert it directly to an f and look up uh, you know, f value 4 to see if it's significant. That's basically how it, it converts that tau squared over to an f or an f via sort of converting it to lambda first. Um, this is like a full on review. I, I think the slides almost are exactly similar or identical to what they were in 45. What if a main effect is significant? If it has more than two levels, you gotta do comparisons, right? So if the, if equal levels or flatness hypotheses are rejected and there are more than two levels, you need to break down the effect to find which levels are different. These are what we call main effects or we use marginal means to actually compare things from before. It's the same thing we did in um, Mixed ANOVA. For significant equal levels test, simply use the compute function SPSS to create averages over all the DVs. So we're just gonna average the DVs. And then um, that way we can create averages for each group um, and then compare them. Uh, use this new variable as a DV and a univariate ANOVA, or you can use post hoc tests and other stuff to implement um, so the comparisons between groups. Uh, if the multivariate test for flatness is rejected, then you turn to interpreting comparisons in univariate uh, within subjects ANOVA. So you're going to get uh, a within subjects ANOVA table along with your multivariate test. And you can actually interpret, start to interpret those univariate ones to see um, where the, you know, which of, you know, so you actually look at the within subjects, repeated measures component, and see if they're significant, and then you can actually then break those down by looking at which DVs are different than which, or which time points are different than which, um, and you can use syntax to do that. If you want to plan it, you can also do, um, you can do some post hoc tests, but you're limited because you can't do things like Chaffe or Tukey and repeated measures but you can do like a Bonferroni adjusted comparison and do those. So it'll compare marginal means and then tell you where the differences are between the DVs. Um, for interactions, again, this is that craziness that we talked about in 45. It's really no difference, no different. Um, so this is your three by four profile analysis, right? If, depending on what is significant, you can cut it up in different ways. Um, if, for instance, it makes sense because if these are the different measures or different DVs, different time points, it actually makes more sense to do it this way, meaning that I want to compare the three groups for uh, for reading. So here's the, the a simple effect or a simple ANOVA that compares all three groups for reading. 
he was one that compares all three groups for uh, dancing, and then all three groups for I think it's TV, all three groups for skiing, and if any of those simple effects are uh, significant, you do simple contrast to compare individual pairs of data. When you're doing a profile analysis, it doesn't make as much sense to do it this way, which is I'm gonna, for group one, like for belly dancers, I'm going to compare reading, skiing other, other, across the different DVs. You can, it's not like it's not, not possible, but it just seems to be sort of stranger to do it that way than it is to sort of do it this way. But you can do a simple repeated measures on over here, and then use that to then do simple comparisons or simple contrasts if there's significant differences. This is really just pulling apart, you have a significant interaction and you want to pull it apart into simple effects followed by simple contrasts. This usually is good if the interaction is significant and like one of the IVs, one of the main effects is significant but the other one isn't. But if everything is significant then it becomes more problematic. When the parallel, parallelism hypothesis is rejected you need to pull apart the data to try and find what the differences are. So simple effects, simple ANOVAs, simple effects and simple contrast sort of help to do that. But um, if parallelism and flatness are significant, equal levels is not significant. Uh, simple effects would be used to compare groups while holding each of DVs constant. That's sort of what I said a second ago. All right. Um, I think I remember disagreeing with how this works, but whatever. You have some choices of how you want to pull it apart. Um, you can do that by. Um, hold back up a second. You, know, you can do a Shafe adjustment there if you want to. If you want to do that for doing multiple comparisons, you can cut it up either across time or across DVs or across groups, depending on how you want to do it. The main thing is what becomes complicated is if parallel, parallelism and equal levels are significant. Uh, actually, it doesn't this get to the point here? Um, all right. So what if everything's significant? You have main effects and interaction that are all significant. Then you're supposed to do these interaction contrasts that in when we in 45 we created by cross multiplying our like codes. Well, here we never really talk about what that actually means, but if you think about we have a three by four ANOVA, what interaction contrasts do is they try to break down the interactions into smaller two by two interactions to see where the interactions might be. So the interactions are between, say, um, belly dancers and politicians between reading and um, dancing, then you can sort of get an idea of why this, you know, those groups are interacting by breaking down to smaller chunks, smaller interaction contrast. And this is what's recommended to do if everything is significant you're trying to break apart the interactions. In reality, you can just do the simple effects, simple contrast, and that's, most people are going to accept that as being totally fine. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else I want to talk about here. I don't think so. Um, uh, if all effects can also be done by using select cases function, selecting two groups, and then doing a mix of NOVA with just those two as a way of sort of breaking down this interaction contrast further. But for the most part, most people stick to the, the simple effects followed by simple contrast, and even if everything is significant, they still sort of break it down that way. So even the Sebastian Fidel recommend that method if everything is significant, if you follow the simple effects and, f and simple contrast sort of approach, I doubt you're going to have someone come back, like an editor, and say, no, you need to do interaction contrast, because they won't be able to understand them even if you do it, I don't think. I get sort of crazy. All right, so let's take a break. Um, this, you know, we wrap this up. Uh, we can come back and uh, see if there's anything left to do on the, the lab. And then start, you know, going through um, any exam questions you might have or other questions you might have before sort of, uh, wrapping up for today.